Hi, welcome to the Bridge Podcasts. We hope you enjoy the following message. For more information on all that's happening at the Bridge Church, please visit www.bridge-church.com. We're going to start a series now called Love Came Down at Christmas. And so today I want to speak to you just for a short time about the evidence of the God kind of love. Amen. Um, I'm thankful. I'm so thankful. I'm sure we all are that Jesus, that beautiful exchange that the guys were singing about, that Jesus came here. And the reality that we, the message, the reality we have to convey to people is that Jesus was really here. He was really here. He was a man and he walked on the earth And he really did do all of those things that are in the Word. And in fact, the Word says also that um, they never recorded everything that Jesus did, because if they did, they would not have had enough books to contain all of the things that he did. And so it's, it's astonishing that in his life of around about 33, 33 and a half years, that he achieved that much. If I was able to put my hand up and say I had achieved that much by the time I turned 33, that would have been a massive achievement. So, but, um, you know, just like, uh, just like Emma was dedicated this morning, Jesus was, as a baby, taken to the temple, and he was also, as was their culture, dedicated to the Lord and uh, began his ministry here, powerful ministry, and... Um, I think he gave his parents a hard time sometimes, disappearing and going off and uh, teaching in the in the in the temple and places like that. But you know what? Just like you were praying this morning, I really had a strong sense of that word activator and activist because I was reading about a peculiar generation that the Lord has. Now that peculiar generation may well be on the earth just now, or it may be coming. It says that that peculiar generation will be a generation that is, that is going to be marginalized, but they are going to be a generation that will, n- that will not compromise on the things of God. They're going to be a generation that, that really follow what God says. They really obey God. They, they, um, they do not hesitate to obey. And because of that fervor, they're going to experience marginalization, but they're going to do amazing things. And so we need to pray that over our young ones because we don't know, you know, God tells us we're a peculiar people, but he says that he has a generation. So that generation, I'm not speculating on when that, where, where it is, but there is a generation rising up right now. They're doing amazing things. So um, thank God uh, for his love, enough love to send Jesus to earth for us. Amen. So in James uh, 1.17, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above um, and comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Just the same way as Emma is a gift to your family. Jesus was a gift to us, you know. And uh, so we thank God that he never changed his mind and you know, he, once, once Jesus, once, that, once he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, there was no going back. And Jesus had a purpose here, and he was taking it through to the end. So um, I want you to go to, in your, in, your, in your Bibles, to Matthew 22, verse 36. Do you bring, do you have your Bibles? Do you have your, do you have your e-Bible? Your i-Bible? So, Go to, go to the word there in Matthew twenty two thirty six. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is You'll unselfishly seek the best or higher good for others. That's amazing. You will unselfishly seek the best or the higher good for others. The whole law and the writings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. Everything is hinging on us 
seeking the best for others. And Jesus came with our best interests, our eternal interests at heart, and uh, totally denied himself to do that. So we're talking about the evidence of the God kind of love this morning. Now, some of us might scream, oh, what kind of love is this? What about me? Where do I come into all of this? We've already got the wrong end of the stick, if that is our immediate reaction. You know, what, where, where am I in all of this? Because the, kind of, the God kind of love is totally a giving love. It, it, doesn't even, it doesn't even enter into it, what about me? It's just a total giving love. And so I want to look at some types of love this morning. And you'll identify, as I mention them, you'll be able to say, oh, Jesus had that kind of love. Or, oh, I've had that kind of love before. Or, so you'll place it. There's lots of types of love. And this is not all of them, by the way, just a few. Selfish love. Selfish love is self-gratifying. It's grat to gratify our flesh. Selfish love is a materialistic love. And uh, it's, all about, it's all about us. It's all about me. That's what selfish love is. Then there's love for self at the expense of others. So that's even taking it to, well, um, selfish love, I'm going to get all I can in whatever way I can. But love for self at the expense of others is I'm even going to do that and use other people as part of the, of the plan, of the formula to achieve that. So that's a really destructive kind of love. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you guys can respond this morning. Seriously then, if that, is, if that kind of love is even on your radar, question your relationship with God. Question. Just say, yeah, is, uh, do I actually have a real connection, a real relationship, a real love? Because... We should never use others to get to be the, the hurdle or the step to another place. It, you know, Jesus always t tried to take people with him. Yeah? Do you, do you know that? Always wanted to take people with him, alongside him, his disciples. Come with me. I will show you. Let me speak to you. I will teach you. He was always bringing them with him. And so, and he, wouldn't, he would never give up on them either, even when they were too tired to, do, to, to, to flow with him, he just, he just kept on going. There's an idealistic love. Idealistic love, some of us will know that, especially if we are single people. We have this ideal of God has someone for me, but somewhere in there, you have the package in your mind you have the whole, you know, I, I just, I see, I see my beloved as this. And there's this package in it. It's got to tick all the boxes. There was there not a Christmas movie we watched with all the tick boxes where they, the, you know, she wanted all the boxes ticked before it was the right person and it all turned around and it was, uh, you know, Kleenex at the end and all of that kind of stuff, you know. But we, we the, the, the truth is that people hardly ever come to us the way that we expect them to. They're always in a different package to what we... God has just has a way of sending us people that are like, I didn't, I didn't expect that. You know, totally different to what I expected. And so that idealistic love can set us up for disappointments. Far better to... I think, I think it's good to leave a bit of mystery in it. Don't you? A bit of, you know, God, I, you, I know that whoever you'll bring my way will be right for me. They might not be exactly the way, uh, you know, they might not be, uh, I'm, I'm laughing now, might not be Greg Laidlaw or someone like that. <laughs> so, but you know what? Never say never. So, uh, you know, so we have this thing and sometimes we, we can be disappointed. The other type of love is a sacrificial love. And uh, that, that love is the ultimate love, really. When you lay down your life for someone else, that is the ultimate love, act of love. Has anyone here ever seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? Yes. What, a, what a movie. And if you remember, Tom Hanks and his, his crew, they set out 
to go and... Uh... By the way, Deja, you are amazing. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't even have this. Or... This is amazing. So they come and they go through literal hell to go and save Private Ryan. His brothers have been killed in combat and his mom's at home and he's the last one there. And these guys go through everything. It was a horrific movie. The opening scenes were horrific. They go through all of that. Eventually, they catch up with his company. They've lost uh, men in the, in the effort to get there. They get to him. And then he, do you remember what he says? Not going, <laughs> not going anywhere. I'm staying here. And, you know, it's a kind of an analogy, but one of the guys in the, in the troop gets really angry. And he says, do you not realize that, that one of our friends was killed coming to save you? And that was just such a powerful moment when you could see the reality of what these guys had gone through to come and get this guy. And so, you know, at times, that sacrificial love, you might not get, that might be rejected, is what I'm saying. You may, know, you may not sacrifice your life, but you may sacrifice and invest a lot of time and effort and love into people, and that might be rejected. And they might take that for granted. But you know what? Love anyway. Just keep on loving and just keep on doing it anyway. So that sacrificial love, and that really is the kind of, that is the, that is the God kind of love for us. That is the love that, that put Jesus on the cross for us. The other type of love is conditional love. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Does that sound familiar? If you love, does that sound like a condition? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So there's conditional love in the sense that God is saying, if you love me, then show me you love me by doing what I tell you to. Satan comes in and he perverts that by saying something along the lines of, and this, you may have experienced this in personal relationships before. If you really love me, you'll do this for me. And it's used as a power tool to control and to manipulate people. If you love me, and you know, it's like, uh, you know, I'm sure that in youth ministry particularly, this is probably something that happens a lot with young people where it's like, well, if you really love me, I'm saying it the way it is this morning, then go to bed with me. But the, the, there's, uh, that is just a perversion of conditional love. And God gave us conditions to walk in. Satan takes everything that, that, that God created for good and to keep us safe, and he perverted it. Amen? Yes. Then there's unconditional love. And this is really also the God kind of love. Because see on the conditional love thing? And he says, if you love me, then keep my commandments. His unconditional love says, but see, if you don't, I'm waiting for you. I'm still here and I'm waiting for you. And that is amazing. That is amazing because how do we, you know, we sometimes give people a chance or two and then our patience runs thin. But God is just, you know, always if your heart is pure and it will turn back and you'll repent, then I'm here and I'll forgive you and we can move on. Isn't that good? Yes. Then there's unlimited love. Unlimited love. Like a never-ending well of love. You know, it's like a chocolate fountain. <laughs> never-ending. You know, it just uh, it keeps on coming. Unlimited love. I believe that you know, uh, that's the kind of love that God has for us too. Just unlimited. There's no limits to it. Um, the kids sing a song in, in kids' life. Well, maybe they don't sing it anymore. So high, can't get over it. So low, can't get under it. Can't get around it. Can't get, can't get over God's love for us. And then there's a love that wanes. Anyone know about love that wanes? 
And that can happen for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it can happen because God has been good to you in your life and he's blessed you and you've followed hard after him. But the, what that has, the blessedness that that has created in your life is actually causing you to take your eyes off of him. And day by day, there's a drawing away and that is a, 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 a it's a, it's a deception, it's a, it's a trap that then these things begin to take priority over God in our lives. He's, he, is, he is, like we said at the beginning in James 1, the giver of every good and perfect give, gift. But we always need to keep these things in, in the right order. Um, so love can wane. I thank God after 20 years, our love hasn't waned. Still love you, sweetheart. And any, who's, who's, who's uh, I think there's some long, long marriages here. Who's, who's at 50 or more? Yes. So um, I believe that with, with, with God at the center of your marriage, your love won't wane. Your love won't wane. It won't, it won't do that. Uh, it'll get stronger. But, you know, uh, in the natural, and I heard a shocking thing this uh, last week, um, because they're trying to make the divorce laws easier in the UK. And I think I might be wrong, open to correction. There's two boxes you can tick to get a divorce. To get a divorce. One is you've committed adultery. The other one is uh, irreconcilable differences. We just can't get on with one another anymore. And uh, the one lady they were interviewing said, well, you know what? I just had to tick a box. I, didn't, I hadn't committed adultery, but w w my husband and I had been together for, such a long, for a long time, and we just fell out of love. So I just ticked the adultery box anyway. I thought, and she's on TV. And so, she's, so this MP down in England, comes to do a little sound bite, and he says, yeah, you know, I think we should make it easier for people to divorce. That is terrible, a terrible way to go. And so, uh, we don't know all the reasons why it happens, but uh, if the consequences of that kind of thing is, is going to be, well, we'll just make it easier for people to divorce, then that's going to affect our future generations because our kids are going to have access to those uh, uh, lesser standards in life. Amen? And then there's love that grows, the opposite to love that wanes. And uh, that kind of love comes by knowing someone more intimately and spending time with them. And I believe that that's a, a love that we can build our lives on, is that when you're intimate with one another and you pray with each other, your love will grow to new levels. There, there'll be nothing that can get in and uh, divide you, I believe. So did, did any of them sound like, yeah, I could see Jesus in that? Amen. So the word tells us that Jesus came for a purpose in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. I won't read the whole thing, but it says at the end of that verse, the Son of God appeared for this purpose. Does anyone know what it was? It actually doesn't say anything about love. It says the purpose was to destroy the works of the evil one. This, that's why Jesus came. The motive behind it was definitely love because Satan was, was let loose and is, is at large in the world. So the motive behind that was love, but he came to destroy the works of the devil. And he came, and the reason for that is because God wouldn't let us go. He won't let us go. Love won't let us go. So he comes to destroy the work of the devil. And love is not a work of the devil. Do you think that that's one of his works, love? He does desire that we worship him, that we idolize him and that the, we basically embrace the worldly system that he's created and uh, live in that and, and enjoy it. And you, you can enjoy it for a season of time. 
But uh, that's not the works that the devil was here for. He's here for totally different stuff, things because his works are the polar opposite to the works that Jesus did. Amen? His works are hate and bitterness, unforgiveness, wrath, you know, all of those things. We could go on and on, but everything that he is about is totally contrary to love. And the kind of love that he does talk about is carnal love. And that is normally the kind of love that is, gratifies uh, yourself at the expense of others. Do you understand that? That is, a, that is the type of love that car, carnal love is. It gratifies ourselves. The polar opposite to that, we bless others at the expense of ourselves. Yes. Amen. The evidence of the God kind of love is when you give up to help others. That's the, one of the evidences of the God, God kind of love. When I married my wife, the day that I married her, I gave up my rights. I gave up a lot of rights. <laughs> As a bachelor boy, I gave up a lot of rights. I went into covenant with her to be a blessing to her life. That's, the, that's what the covenant was for. And so I had to embrace Linda. I had to deny a lot of things about me. And she had to do the same. She was the part of the covenant. So she was part of the co covenant giver. And I have a responsibility towards her because we're in covenant together. The same way as you are. The same way as, you know, Emma came with much labor in many ways. Physical and everything else. And... Uh, you know, there's that uh, responsibility there, you know, because she's flesh of your flesh. And it's the same when we get married. I become one. The word says I become one with my wife. So you can, can you see where, it is, where the power is there? And so um, denying myself or denying ourselves is an evidence of love. And uh, I have to ask myself every day, how willing am I to give up my wants and my needs and my desires? And uh, I, I, the, the guys, were, we were together having our uh, men's meeting last week and we were talking about some of these things. And every day I wake up, someone gets up with me. <laughs> it's not Linda, although she does get up at the same time sometimes. <laughs> but, but when I get up in the morning, my flesh gets up with me. When I get up in the morning, my flesh is up at the same time. So I have a choice every day to operate in my flesh or to deny myself and say, Lord, what have you got for me to do today? What's my mission today? And uh, almost always, God's gonna, that's going to involve a love and sacrifice. When you say, God, what's my mission? Be prepared for an answer that's going to come and probably say, oh, hang on, Lord, my schedule just doesn't accommodate that. So it's like, well, you asked me what you wanted me to do today, so here's what to do. Amen? The word, the word says, take up your cross daily. And uh, in Matthew uh, 16, 24, if you want to go there, it says there, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, set aside selfish interests, and take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. Are you willing to endure whatever comes your way? And follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living, and if need be, if needs be, suffering and dying with me because of your faith in me. For whoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it through death. But whoever loses his life in this world for my sake will find it. That is life with me for all eternity. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, wealth, fame, and success, but forfeits his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory and majesty of his Father with his angels, and then he will repay each one in accordance with what he has done. Amen. That lays it out, like flat out, there it is. That is, there's, there's, there isn't another way. When we read the word, especially the new covenant, because we're not first covenant people anymore, we're new covenant people, there's hardly a chapter that you can turn over where you don't see the evidence of God's love. Isn't that right? There's, there's hardly a chapter where it's not like, wow, God, you did that because you loved that person. You, it was because of love. And so we can see clearly that Jesus loves. Now, Jesus went about doing good, healing the sick, um, delivering people from uh, demons and all of these things. He's never changed. God wants to help you solve your problems. God wants you to be healed. God wants you to live a full life. God wants you to be happy in your marriage. God wants you to be uh, uh, happy with your kids and your family. God wants all of these things. Um, These are all good things. He wants to prosper you. Yeah. And we can say amen to all of that. But God, because he loves us, also has to chastise us and correct us when we're wrong. So that, that love is a two-sided coin. There's the love that, that, will, that he'll release into your life to take you further. It's never going to eliminate tests or trials. I don't believe it will. But on the other side of that coin, there's a love that he says, whoa, and he has to yank you and say, well, stop. I need to tell you this is not right. I need to show you this is not right. Sometimes that, sometimes that will come through a friend. Sometimes it will come through someone, sometimes it will come through someone that you don't even really like very much. And then it's really difficult to receive. But do you know what? Um, the book of Proverbs talks about the wise man. And the, 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 there, there's wisdom in just discerning who God has for your life and listen to them when they speak into your life. And so uh, God is never, he hasn't changed. He's still doing the same thing today because he loves us. And so he wasn't here, you know, the Passion of the Christ movie, you know, really shows us that he didn't come to earth just to be a nice guy. He was a good man, but he was a He was a zealous man, fervent man. And he was here to expressly do what his father said you're here to do. And so he was tenacious to go right through, to to go the Via Dolorosa to the cross, to go to the very end, tenacity, never giving up. You know, some of us, we get to the, we've got a a pain threshold in our lives. (laughs) And it's like, whoa, too much pain, enough And we have to do something at that point. We either have to go beyond that pain threshold, often to the prize. I was speaking to to the guys and I said, there's an event in, in, uh, in North America called the Anvil. It's five Ironman triathlons in one week. It's five triathl, it's five Ironman triathlons in one week. The entry field for this event, now most people say, if I could do one Ironman triathlon in my life, that is like, you know how people say, I want to run a marathon before I die, just a marathon. They go sign up for the London Marathon. They go down and they do it. Everything's cool. I've done a marathon. Then you've got these guys, and some people call them nuts for the Ironman, right? They go, they, they, you know, do that. But then there's another level of nutcase, and they do the anvil, Forgive me not to be derogatory to people, but most people would look and say, you are, you are crazy. This is, you are uh, on the go for five days. They, you compulsory have to take seven hours of sleep a day. The rest of the time, you're in the water, on your bike, or on your feet. Now, by day two, most of them are delirious. <laughs> they actually, uh, you know, they, they are not themselves. 
Their bodies are reacting to all sorts of uh, chemistry that's going on because of the sheer effort. Quite often they use duct tape to duct tape up their feet to their shins because all of their ankle area is just getting completely torn apart. They, uh, the one guy on his bike duct taped his helmet onto his back to keep his head up. When he was riding his bike, he couldn't keep his head up to see where he was going. They go through a pain threshold. It's unbelievable. Um, I mean, we won't even go into the skin and everything. But at the end of the event, they take a hammer and they hit this big anvil. Dang! Can you imagine in the wilderness there, they hit this massive anvil and this anvil goes off. They go through hell to achieve that. It's amazing. Let's think about that as we go in our daily, day-to-day being. What are we willing to go through? Are we going to go through the pain threshold or go beyond it? Just a thought. Amen. And so, have you ever heard the, the, the phrase, you can read that guy like a book? You can read him like a book. Because the reality is that our life's evidence every day exactly who we are, what our character is, and what we're all about. And that's why people say, I can read you like a book. I think those closest to us, we can almost like tell before they even do something that they're going to do that next. And, uh, you know, if you, were, if you had your friends and your family, your colleagues at work and that around you today, and uh, you were to go on trial, and they were to convict you of love, of being a loving guy, would you, <laughs> would you be, would you be uh, bang to rights? So, does, has anyone, I know the Bible school students will know this, but has anyone ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Some of you have heard it if you work in psychology or the care industry and all of that. And um, I'm sure we did it in Bible school. I'm pretty sure we did it in Bible school. And basically, it's this big triangle. And then at the bottom, it's very wide. And it's basically, if you don't get that, you're, you're dead. You're dead. <laughs> Oxygen, food, water, and all of that. Somewhere around about the middle of the triangle comes love. So, you don't need love to survive. It comes somewhere around about the middle. And it used to be five tiers of Maslow's hierarchy, but now it's about eight. They've added more. But basically, the pinnacle of the Maslow's triangle is self-actualization. Basically, at the top, you are everything that you can possibly be. You are everything. You are complete in every single way You've got all of those building blocks, and now you've, you're at the top. Um, what about the love and belonging, though? It comes around about the middle, receiving and giving love, affection, trust and acceptance, being part of a group. And then all of these different things, self-esteem, respect, Cognitive needs, that was a new one. Aesthetic needs, to be beautiful. That's now second from the top, to be beautiful. To be beautiful. To be in perfect symmetry, whatever you do. Whether it's you as a person, or whatever it is you do. And then the very top one, self-actualization. Realizing your full potential. Becoming everything one is capable of being becoming. I think that's all very well, but I believe God knows what we need. I believe that because I remember the donut man. And if anyone remembers donut man from kids church, donut man was a Christian guy and his main message was donut with a hole in the middle and that hole is there and you need something to fill that hole. Donut man. And that was his message that we have a need for something in our lives to be complete. And that is love. That's the love of God. I believe that is the thing that completes us. 
and makes us belong. Amen? Amen. So, God knows what we need. We know that. Luke 4.4 4 says, Jesus answered the devil saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So just saying, I know what you need. You need the word. That's what you need. John 6.35, Jesus replied to them, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry. And the one who believes in me as savior will never be thirsty for that one will be sustained spiritually. It's like even more. Okay, so you really do know what we need, Lord. Yes, I know what you need. This is, this is what you need. Let me read this. Uh, uh, ver- oh, where, where is this? Is this? Uh, I don't have my reference here, Deja, I'm sorry. Uh, therefore, I tell you, stop being worried or anxious, perpetually uneasy about your life. As to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you're going to wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow seed or reap the harvest. They don't gather crops into barns, and yet your heavenly Father keeps feeding them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by worrying, can add one hour to the length of your life? And why are you worried about clothes? See how the lilies and the wildflowers of the fields grow. They don't labor, nor do they spin wool to make clothing. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory and splendor dressed himself like one of these. So if God clothed the grass of the field, which is alive and green today, and tomorrow is cut and thrown as fuel into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry or be anxious. What are we going to eat what are we going to drink? Go back to Maslow, hierarchy one. Don't worry what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what are we going to wear? For the pagans, Gentiles, eagerly seek all these things. But don't worry, for your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He knows what we need. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is fine, but God knows what we need. When we, when, he knows when we need it, And he'll meet it when we need it, if we trust him. But first and most importantly, seek his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And all of these things will be given to you also. Don't worry about tomorrow because it's going to have enough trouble of its own tomorrow. So God makes a way for us. I believe that he meets our needs so that we can live a life free of concern, free of worry, and free of anxiety. Why? Because he knows that if we can live a life without cares and anxiety, and we know who we are in him because he loves us, then we can, take, we can get out to the world that re- needs this right now, instead of being caught up in our cares and our anxieties. You know, he says that that I'm the light of the world and we are his lights. If we are lanterns, then lanterns need fuel to burn. The fuel is love. That's what it is. The lantern fuel is love. So um, to be a light in a dark place, to be a light on, to be a city on the hill, to be a light to, to, to those around us, then we need to, we can't be concerned about every day. We wouldn't go out. The light would be inside somewhere and it wouldn't get out, it'd be trapped. And you might say that's just unrealistic. It's not for, that's just not life. I believe that if our trust is 100% in God, then that kind of life can be a reality. You can live a carefree life. You can live a, a, you know, you can live a life that is not, doesn't bog you down with worry. In 2 Corinthians 4, it says, Pressed but not crushed, persecuted not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Amen. So we know when Paul told us, you're going to be persecuted, struck down, all of this, but you're not going to be destroyed. And um, so we need to, to be that light. We need to keep on going and because uh, we are the messengers. And we need to compel people not to reject God, who is love. And I, I, there was a news documentary on last week, and there's a 
Few European countries, you probably know this, because of Brexit and all of these things, there's, un, there's uh, stirring going on in these countries, like Italy was one, and this was an Italian lady that was on the, uh, on the news uh, uh, thing. And uh, she made a statement that stopped me in my tracks. She says, the, the people are choosing Barabbas. The people are choosing Barabbas. Do you know who Barabbas was? The people were choosing Barabbas. In other words, in her context, she was saying, there is a way that we should go in our country. In her opinion, okay, let's, let's take that into account. There is a way that we should go, but the people are rejecting it. They're choosing the Barabbas. And I thought, wow, that's, <laughs> that's incredible. Um, because, you know, it took me right back to uh, Jesus on trial. And Jesus, Jesus is the embodiment of love, standing there in front of all of these people. And they rejected him, and they chose Barabbas. So we need to, we've got some time, we need to compel people to stop and listen to us or to someone or give them something that they will listen to, to tell them about, about God and who he is. He's a God of love. I'm going to finish the message and I'm going to read this passage of scripture from 1 John 3 and then I'm going to stop. It is, it is probably a few minutes. Will you give me a few minutes to read this and then we're, 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 we are done for today. 1 John 3 from the Amplified Bible. Talking about children, us, the children of God loving one another. See what an incredible quality from verse 3. See what an incredible quality of love the Father has shown to us. That we would be permitted to be named and called and counted the children of God. And so we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness, ignoring God's law by action or neglect or by tolerating wrongdoing, being unrestrained by his commands and his will. You know that he appeared in visible form as a man in order to take away our sins. And in him there is absolutely no sin, for he has neither the sin nature nor has he committed sin or acts worthy of blame. No one who abides in him, who remains united in fellowship with him, deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practices sin. No one who habitually sins has seen him or known him. Little children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who practices righteousness, the one who strives to live a consistently honorable life in private as well as in public, and to conform to God's precepts is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin, separating himself from God and offending him by acts of disobedience, indifference or rebellion, is of the devil and takes his inner character and moral values from him, not from God. For the devil has sinned and violated God's laws from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practices sin because God's seed, his principle of life, the essence of his righteous character, remains permanently in him who is born again, who is reborn from above, scripturally transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose. And he who is born again cannot habitually live a life characterized by sin because he's born of God and longs to please him. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are clearly identified. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not unselfishly love his believing brother. It's interesting to note there that, he's, that that is talking about us. It's talking about believers. This is a strong message to people that actually believe in the Lord, that are, that, are, that, are, that are redeemed, who are not loving each other. 
For this is the message which you believers have heard from the beginning of your relationship with Christ, that we should unselfishly love and seek the best for one another and not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother Abel. And why did he murder him? Because Cain's deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Don't be surprised, believers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters he who does not love remains in spiritual death. He who does not love remains in spiritual death. Everyone who hates works against or everyone who hates or works against his brother, working against someone else in the Lord, is at heart a murderer by God's standards. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know and have come to understand the depth and the essence of his precious love that he willingly laid down his life for us because he loved us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the believers. But whoever has the world's goods, adequate resources, and sees his brother in need but has no compassion for him, how does the love of God live in him? Little children... Let us not love merely in theory, with word or with tongue, giving lip service to compassion, but love in action and in truth. In practice and in sincerity, because practical acts of love are more than words. By this we will know without any doubt that we are of the truth and will assure our heart and quiet our conscience before him. It's impossible to live without a... a we need to have a clear conscience. Amen. Amen. We, uh, uh, a cloudy conscience or, a, un, or, a, or a, a conscience that is not clear, we're, we will be defeated. And that we're just going to be defeated. Whenever our heart convicts us in guilt, for God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Nothing is hidden from him because we are his hands. Beloved, if our heart does not convict us of guilt, we have confidence complete assurance and boldness before God. And we receive from him whatever we ask because we carefully and consistently keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight, habitually seeking to follow his plan for us. And we finish with this. This is his commandment, that we believe with personal faith and confident trust in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and that we unselfishly love and seek the best for one another. That is so good. Just as he commanded us, the one who habitually keeps his commandments, obeying his word and following his precepts, abides and remains in him, and he in him. By this we know and have the proof that he really abides in us by the spirit whom he, whom he has given us as a gift. Amen. Amen. You know, each one of you will reach someone with the love of God. And sometimes, you, when we're talking about the package, some people are big, slavery Labradors of love. And I know some people that don't do the hugging thing. You know, but you get people, that is their love, their method of love. It's big, it's huge, and it's all over you. And then there's people... It's like, it's like a, a boxer. I love the boxing ones, Joe. It's like Mike Tyson and Sugar, Le Sugar Ray Leonard. Mike Tyson was bludgeoned people. Sugar Ray Leonard, was, uh, he was a technician of the sport. And we can, we, some of us will be hammers and some of us will be scalpels. Some of us, will reach people by just <laughs> saturating them with love. And they might feel a bit uncomfortable about it at first, but keep on doing it. But some of us will reach people because we will, will reach them in very, very critical areas where they need someone to be uh, incisive in their life. Do you, do you agree with that? Amen. So praise the Lord. Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter.